So, um, last week we discussed one of the things, uh, we, we did Keeping the Boat Flat, which is really good, and we looked at some weather forecasting. And um, I showed you some techniques of putting together a forecast, including that brain cast where we have a look out the window, we look at what the local observations are on the, on the platform or wherever, and we have a quick look at the synoptic chart, the surface pressure chart. We build a picture in our mind of what's going on with the weather. And then we go and check the forecast apps and correlate that and then watch it through the day. And at the end of the day, review it and see how we scored. And I left you with the challenge of putting one of those together for a day this week. Now, I hope you all held out and waited till today <laughs> because this is the best day by miles. This is a really special day. Uh, Cal, was, can I just say, on. I did better than that. I did go it on. five minutes ago. Just to try to get me home. That is really current. But <laughs> how, you, how did you look out the window? How did that go? Uh, it was a bit. You dark. meant to do it in the morning for the day ahead sailing Commodore. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. Backing away. Did anybody have a go at this? Anyone else? Yeah, I, I did. I did it for sat, uh, Sunday, though. Okay, David. Yeah, what was Sunday like? Um, very calm. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. Do you um, want me to share it with you? <laughs> oh, that'd be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can do that. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I like that sure. a lot. I think I'll have to make you the host there, um, David. So I'll just oh, well. Can you hand, do that? You, hand you the con. Excellent. Make host. Or I could make you a co host. I'll make you the Thanks. host. You now have full control of the sailing club. Oh, Commodore, yeah. hand in the keys. I've oh. <laughs> got to find it now. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's all right. I've never used it on this computer, Zoom. I use Teams normally. Um, I don't know if you're going to see it. There's a share at the bottom if you can see it, and then yeah, I've hit share at the bottom, but I can't see. Uh, let's have a look. There That's we good. go. Yep. Can you see I work for higher? Oh, app? brilliant! Yeah, excellent. Oh, okay. Ho, 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 this is professional. Hey, uh, well, you really inspired me there, so you know. Oh, oh wonderful. <laughs> Uh, talk us through it. So this, I was going to sail on the Limington. I was looking to sail at the weekend with the kids. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the map of the harbour and the tide times for Sunday. Um, so this was Saturday evening. Um, I mean, I did your look at the window, but obviously from home, I was just looking at the treetops. So I the movement. Um, but Sunday was looking good. Um, I also looked at the tide times. You can see the high sort of moving out, but still over the top. Um, I thought this was quite good from the bird's eye view, which was a bit like your drawing. Well, where did you find that? Was that you? That was that on the Lymington Harbour site. It's got a sort of link to the, oh, sorry, from the starting platform. It's yeah. got a link to bird's eye view. Okay, lovely. Which I thought was quite, because you, no, your, your sketch was a bit like that, wasn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. perfect, actually. It's, it, in fact, if anything, it's, yeah, it's better. I like that. Yeah. It's quite clever, isn't it? I thought. Yeah, it's cool, that. Oh, that's so um, and this is when I sort of decided we would go because of the tide. Um, although we were sort of looking to go around 2, 2.30 uh, because the tide was... Um, I didn't really want the wind and the tide against me coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that would be the better time to go. So how accurate did you feel your forecast was to what you experienced when you were out there? It's difficult to say because obviously I'm, I'm in Exbury, so I'm <laughs> looking at a tree. <laughs> and you'd have taken the thing off the platform and things and, and you know. You... Yeah, um, but I, was, you know, I slightly did it did different, you know, in that I was trying to sort of plan for a sale um, and I'll okay. try and use the brain, but... Um, Exbury would give you a fairly, you know, you're still on the same on the on the coast, yeah, not, you're not too, far away. Yeah, you're going to experience yeah. the same, the same, the same. I think I thought it was a little bit gustier, but um, yeah, okay, that's really good. Thanks for that. Really nice. And well, what what do we think about sort of just others just looking at the um, high pressure system on the left? What what do we think about the spacing on those isobars? Well, I have to say. If I can interject, I thought it, the wind was going to be a lot lighter than it actually was, based on the spacing between those bars. 
Mm. Yeah, you've caught me out because that happened on Saturday as well. And I, nor anybody I asked, had a really good explanation for it. (laughs) Having gone through that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I mean, the high pressure was governing, but yeah, there's probably a bit more squirt under it, wasn't there? We certainly found that on Saturday initially. Saturday morning, I think we... We, we, we launched at 12.30 in the end, and I think the best breeze came through about 11, but it was much stronger than expected. Yeah, you know, I saw the forecast. Initially, oh, I think Sunday was, Saturday was a little bit more, wasn't it? Mm, the forecast got it right, though, but the, looking at the isopods, it didn't appear that way. No. That was interesting. So that was my first attempt, really. Oh, it's brilliant. No, that's really cool. Oh, it's great. Are you getting your head I'm normally what's doing going the car on before the before training, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's perfect to do that. It gets you thinking while you've got a cup of coffee. It yeah, takes a while to put something like that together, and I can appreciate that. So you, you can get it down to sort of quite a brief just... Yeah, I'd get it down to just... But that's really nice to do. Yeah. Is, you know, it was a lot stronger on Saturday than than it was for, uh, than you would think looking at the, the isobars. Yeah. It's in the high to the low and channeling along the, the isobars that were t- between us and France. Yeah, so the, was, so the winds are going. Yeah, they might have been round, round the isobars. Yeah, but you're still looking for. Because I've noticed that before. It, it, yeah, it, it wasn't. I don't think I did. I can't remember if I took a photo of it. I might have done, but I'll, I'll mm. if I find that, I'll have a look at it. But really, um, does anyone else put anything together for us? Tell me. David, could you just make me the host again? If you go to the list of um, participants. Sorry, no. Yeah, and then if you just go again, some more on the on that. Oh, you want me to hand it over to you? Oh, yeah, that works. Yeah, 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 it's fine. Make host. Here we go, Carl. Just keep your eye out in case anyone joins late as well, Carl. Yeah, yeah, I can see that coming. It tells me. We're Does missing else? The- James. We're missing what, sorry? The Honourable Kate James. She's usually at these sessions. Oh, yeah. Well, if you watch it on Catch Up, it's all right. Yeah. It's because she didn't do her homework. I know what it is. <laughs> Anyone else? Anything to offer, to add? All right. Did Claire find a dog then? I think she <laughs> must have done. <laughs> all right. Um, shall I show you today? Do you want to have a quick look? Yeah. Okay. Let's have a very quick look. Um, right. So similar to David then, uh, this is today's chart. Um, this is the situation at midnight last night. Can you all see that clearly enough? I, I didn't get time to put this on a proper PowerPoint, but it's in my sort of weather journal that I keep. And what's the first thing you notice? What's the system we're being dominated by? Or systems is the clue. Or pressure. Do the the pressure, which ones? Uh, the uh, if we number them, remember nine six eight. Yeah, and a little bit of nine nine six. Yeah, it's nine sixty. It's two. There's two pressure systems that were being influenced by, and this is really really interesting. If you watch the progression of the forecast, just with those two weather systems, what's what happens? This one's up near Iceland. This one's mid-Atlantic, kind of, what's that? South, southeast of Greenland. As you move up, can you see what's happening? So this is 12 hours later, forecast for lunchtime today. So this one stays pretty much where it is. This one starts to move across. It's now much more southeast of Greenland. It's moved about 1,500 kilometers. It's moved massively. Then look at this. By midnight tonight, this one stayed where it is, and this one's circulating round it, and it's now, that's up off um, northwest Scotland. And by tomorrow, lunchtime, the whole thing's joined into a wanna. 
And that's where we're going to get the massive breeze tomorrow. So I was fascinated by this. And I thought with two cyclones rotating around each other, it was um, something special. So I messaged a good friend of mine who's a um, meteorologist with the Navy. And he came back to me and gave me a very detailed explanation of what was going on, which I've read three times and don't fully understand. <laughs> but what I did get from it was weather bomb, yeah. which I liked. <laughs> so the, what do we think for lunchtime today then? With the, I think this is probably the most interesting one here, this, this piece here. And I don't think I can blow it up any, so I'm hoping you can see it okay. What do we think about the ice bars where we live? What about direction? What does that tell us? We've got effectively a big low pressure. If you treat the low pressure as one effectively and it's coming up through the approaches here, what direction do we feel that is? Lots of southwesterly. It's a big southwesterly, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And the red line coming across, what do we think that is? Rain. Warm front. Lots it's of a rain. warm front. Anything with a line in it, warm it might. Anything a, with a rule of thumb is rain. Generally, it's a mix. It's, it's air mass changing. So yeah, it's rain coming over, which we had all afternoon. Um, and then if we just flick on to, oh, I thought this was interesting. This is from Windy, and it's um, it's not the surface pressure chart, but it's the chart taken at 250 hectopascals, which is um, 10 kilometers or 34,000 feet. And it's where you typically find the jet stream. And this is a streak within the jet stream. Um, here, this white. So the white is over hundred knots. And I actually did a video of this, but I won't, I won't bother showing it, of this progressing over 48 hours coming across it. So we're here where that 66 is, and you could see it coming across going up to 120, then back over again as the jet stream passed over. And what you tend to find with the jet stream is you tend to get lows to the north of it and highs to the south of it, which you could just about see on this one. Okay, I just mm -hmm. thought that was interesting. If we're getting big wind, big weather, there's normally, it's normally jet stream associated. So I thought that was interesting to have a quick look at. Crikey, the Admiral's just coming in now. Ah, ah. Here he comes. Oh my word. Hello, Hugh. Hey, mate. Is the barber open in Lanzarote? I don't know. I, I don't, don't know, know what I look like. Cut. I thought you'd had a haircut. He's done well, I don't know now. Uh, <laughs> I can't see what I look <laughs> like, so I therefore don't know how bad I look. No, you look all right. Look neat and tidy. That's why I thought you'd had a haircut. I did. Yes, it was the wife. Oh, well, very good. I'll be round. Sorry, sorry, I've only turned up late. It's very impressive. It, it's how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> you're just having I'll a look at today's now, weather. Right. No, we're just looking at today's weather, Hugh. Weather bomb. All right, nice. I've had it verified. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like down there? Can we see? We're slightly um, off the chart for you, yeah, aren't we? Yeah, it was it's proper windy. It was, um, I reckon we were sailing in 20 to... 20. Well, 18 to 25, and if you'd have got outside, if you'd have gone uh, offshore a little bit, we'd have been in 35 plus. So Hugh's down in Lanzarote at the moment um, with a training camp. That's why our view from the uh, lower latitudes. Yeah. Okay, this is just another one I wanted to show you very quickly. Again, it's this low. Um, the two lows there. But what I didn't talk to you about, that spacing on the isobars I talked about the other day. If you look at the black and white um, one on the Met Office, it shows you this wind scale. I don't know why it doesn't do it on the color. But what that does, if you look at this little red bar I've put in there, that's the spacing on the isobars where we're at lunchtime today. And what you do is you put that spacing and you measure it out on the scale here at the latitude where we are at 50, and it will give you a wind strength. Um, so it's showing us there that the wind strength, this is base wind strength without gust, is 25 knots. And that I think was fairly, fairly accurate on the forecast. If I go to um, 12 o'clock today, so, say, sorry, it's a bit small. Yeah, it's saying 23 gusting 37 there. 
and we said Southwest, didn't we? And so that's what we're getting there. We? So um, what is interesting here is just looking at the, the cross section of the atmosphere at 12 o'clock. Um, um, you can see we've got south southwest down the bottom here. And as we go up, it swings around as we go up in altitude up to the point where that 200 hectopascals just above our 100 knots. Okay. So that's kind of just above the jet stream. So that's kind of just or, well, it is the jet stream, isn't it, at that point? I thought that was interesting to see that. So a massive amount of gustiness because of the amount of mixing we're getting. Uh, was there anything else to show you on this? This was the, the, the final tally today um, at the end of the day. So gusting over 40 knots, wasn't it? 45, it's probably even more now. And the interesting thing to look at is at Hearst, you can see um, it has a barometer on there very helpfully. And this is what I was interested in, is the drop in 24 hours. So it's up at something like 1,015 and it's down to um, like 995 or something in 24 hours. So it's a massive drop, hence the breeze. And that breeze is just coming in more. Okay. So that was oh. today's weather. Oh. Yeah. Quick question. So going back up to that interesting aerogram you had. Yes, yes, yes. Is there anything we can read into that from a sailing perspective? Yeah, I think it's, it's more on a normal day is how much um, mixing you're getting vertically, how stable is the atmosphere or not. Um, so if it's gusty at a low level or strong winds at low level, you can expect that to be pulled down and experience it. I've gone into a bit more detail on this on some of the resources I've put on the weather and tides section of the town website now. So if you want to read any articles on this and how to interpret some of this, that's on there now. Okay. Yeah, and exactly. How do you, and, and there's a really good one by Simon Rao, a video that's referenced on there that goes into much better detail about how that mixing occurs. Instability. Right, any more questions on the weather? Are we okay for a bit longer than I thought? It was so interesting today. Yep. Should we move on to some tides? Yep. Right. Oh, I stopped showing there. I didn't think so. I'll come back to that. I shall share again. Carl, are you with me? I am, yep. Um, before you move Jeff. on from that one, mm -hmm. can I just be so bold as to generate another topic of conversation for some? Yeah, um, please, yeah. But others will generally ignore, which is absolutely fine. And some on the floor I know will have much better knowledge than I. Um, I but forgot it, I had a geography teacher on. What was I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. No, it, uh, all I'm going to load in, and, uh, and the skiff sailors particularly are wary of this one, is the amount of liquid in the air mass, which makes the loads on our rigs heavier when we go out in different wind strengths. And I refer to it as saturated adiabatic lapse rate. So if we've got a bigger amount of liquid held in, within a cubic meter of air, we've got a bigger mass loading against us than when we have a dry adiabatic lapse rate. So it's just nice, dry, hum hot air. We haven't got the liquid mass push pushing against us. If we've got a big, fat, wet area of wind blowing against us, we've got much bigger loads to deal with in the same wind strength band. Very good. Which is what this diagram shows in effect. Oh. Yeah. There you go. I won't go into that one. I wasn't really intended to go. I just captured that just from my own notes. But that was um, it's effectively talking about what what um, Jeff's mentioning there. If you want to know more about this, again, go into one of those articles on the weather and tide piece about soundings and skew T diagrams. It's getting really out of scope for this, but it is. I find it dead interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. Wetter air will be heavier. Will. Yeah, it'll feel more loud. That's yeah. fair enough. Carl, uh, Paul just put on the chat, 
Um, oh, yep. Sorry, I missed that. That's all right. It's just come up. Can be answered later, but would love to know how you capture those timeline charts in the Met Office and place them into your journal. Maybe we'll do that at the end. Oh, yeah, I can show you to do that. It's just a cut and paste on the Mac. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, should we do some tides? Cool. Okay, um, what I was conscious of, um, I think was, we've got quite a few newcomers to the area um, and maybe just as quite a good recap for some of the others of you who've been sailing here for a while. But I've spent a couple of centuries sailing really slow boats around these waters and I thought it'd be fun to share some real simple rules of thumb I've got about what to worry about with the tides. And then I thought I'd dress it up a little bit more around those simple rules of thumb um, to give you a background of where that comes from and what we're looking at and to help you paint a mental picture of what's going on. Okay, so we're just gonna concentrate on the tides in the Western Solon on our doorstep as we come out the river in our sailing area between us and effectively Yarmouth. So this was a view taken yesterday. Um, there's two points of interest to this for me, or three points. Oh, hang on, the birthday boy's trying to come back in. He must have eaten all his cake. He's done the washing up now. I think he's done the washing up. Should we check, we'll check in with that? So three points of interest for me on this diagram. First of all, Hearst Castle is still standing on that one. Mm. Just 24 hours ago. Secondly, is the composition of the bottom, just out of interest. This is a sort of mud that we get and a bit of sort of shingly inshore. So when you do dip your mast in the mud in the shallow water out here, this is why it comes up nice and black. And the third thing was, this was yesterday afternoon about two o'clock and it's the streaks in the sky, impending doom. Mm -hmm even on the nice day. Okay, that's why I thought that picture would be interesting to just show. Right, let's see what we're gonna go through proper. Um, we're gonna have a look at some assumed knowledge, um, what I kind of expect you to know at this, level, at this sort of stage. And if you don't, we'll fill in the gaps for you. Um, what we need to know about sailing out of Limington with the tides, some general advice about that, and then building up a mental picture of what the actual bottom of the Solent, a cross section of the bottom of the Solent looks like between us and Yarmouth in that area that we're gonna sail. Okay. Right, assume knowledge. Why do we get tides? This is a Q&A. Unmute and give me some answers, please. Moon in the sun. The moon. <laughs> the moon in the sun, 10 points each, perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What is the difference between spring and neap tides? A meter and a half. Moon. <laughs> <laughs> a high high and a low low a high high and a low which one's which the spring gives you a high 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 and a low low and the neat gives you a low high and a high low very good and what's another way of expressing that anybody what do you call the difference between a high and a low range range, range. so spring is the biggest so range and neap is the smallest range. And what do you think that does for the tidal flow? Uh, a lesser range. tidal flow at neaps and a greater tidal flow at springs. Perfect, that's why it's important to know. Yeah, brilliant. Lovely. Where do we find the tide times and heights from? So oh, the uh, hydrology uh, website. Hi, <laughs> That's one answer, yeah, good. Anywhere else? BBC Web. Uh, the, board, the board as you launch at Limington. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Almanac. Yeah, Almanac's good. Yeah, Almanac's good. Google. Tide, Google, well, yeah, you can Google it, yeah. High Water, Portsmouth, Limington, whatever you want. And just normal tide tables, just paper tide tables you can pick up in the channel room. Always keep one of those in the oh. bag. Or well, they're from um, Harbour Master. Yep, yep. 
So what tidal range is? We just discussed that. What was that? What did I say tidal range was? Between high tide and low tide. Yeah, between the height between high tide and low tide, yeah. Okay, so just to confirm you had it right, yeah, moon and sun's gravitational pull, very good. Springs have the biggest range, the fastest flow. Neeps have the smallest, the slowest flow. Tide tables, internet, yeah, harbour master, somebody said. And tidal range is the high water height minus the low water height. Okay, I'm just going to qualify this before Jeff jumps in again because I'm preempting this. We accept that there are some unusual effects concerning tide on the central south coast. These are out of scope for tonight's discussion. <laughs> I need an expert. So things I'm referring to there are things like double high waters. Okay, they don't really affect the sailing water that we're in out in the Solent. Okay, we're only interested in the tide going left and right and how yep. strong it's going left and right and where it's going to be going the strongest. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So this is a website I use for my tides. Um, it's the Royal Navy site at Portsmouth. Um, I like using Portsmouth for the tides because like all the tidal atlases are based on them. If you use Livington, that's fine. Just be consistent and understand what that means. I'm going to talk in reference to Portsmouth tonight, though. Um, and so if we look at today's tide, what time is high water today? At Portsmouth. 916 or 2202. Very good. And how high is high water at those times? 4.1 meters and 4.2 meters. Yeah. And are we at springs or neaps? Uh, coming up to spring. Yeah, the next few days will progress on to springs, but what about today? Are we spring or neap? Don't know. Uh, we're on a neap today. Neap so how can I tell that? I can tell that from the range, the range. here, but more importantly, yeah. there's a tidal coefficient on the end here, as the French call it, which mm -hmm. I think is a more accurate thing. So what yeah. that is, is a percentage of um, the range you'd expect range. at mean spring, or the mean range at springs. Okay, so 40% tells me that that's quite neapy. And as I go on, as Claire said, it's building up to springs up till um, Sunday, Monday, there'll be spring tides, but they're not massive spring tides because they're only 95% of the mean. I think a couple of weeks ago, you were seeing these at about 120%. Okay. But these are a really good way. So knowing high water time is essential and knowing this coefficient, I find is a really good thing as well to know where we are on springs and neaps. I don't need to know what the actual height is because we don't sail at Portsmouth, but this bit I find fascinating. That's why I use the Navy one. That's why I use the Navy one. That's again is referenced on the page I've put up on the website for you. Okay, so I'll just show you that. I'll just show you that. What do we need to know at Limington? I don't think we need to know more than three or four things. Okay, so let's, this is it. I've already mentioned that I advise using Portsmouth for your tidal time reference um, because the tide atlases are based on that. Okay. But if you do have an alternative tidal trusting yeah. method, stick with it and be consistent. Okay. So here's the news if you're not sure. If you're new to Livington, the tide comes in to the east. So it comes in through Hurst and travels up to the east. That's the flood. And it goes out. I've written rises there, that's wrong. Hang on, you have to do that thing where I uh, edit on the fly. Why would I put that? <laughs> I'm drinking heavily. <laughs> well, it's quite the opposite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh we're on meeting. No, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I didn't that's think right. that's <laughs> Yeah. Falls goes, ebbs, goes out to the west, okay? And as an anomaly of where we live, the ebb is normally much stronger than the flood. Okay, take my word for it. An easy rule of thumb is that the tide turns on our shoreline an hour before high water and low water Portsmouth. Okay, so it comes in all the way to an hour before high water Portsmouth, and goes out all the way to an hour before low water Portsmouth. That's a really easy way to remember. So if you've got that Portsmouth tide time, you can tell 
which way the tide's going to be going. Okay. And you can also tell us, say, from that percentage, whether we're on springs or neaps. If you've forgotten to look at the springs or neaps thing, at Limington, lunchtime highs indicate a spring tide. Okay. So the other thing we've got here is that the tidal stream on our side of the Solent, which I like to call England, is the weakest and it, as it has the shallowest water for a long way out. Okay, and we'll go into that in a minute, showing you how it progresses across the Solent. So those are the things we need to know. Which way it floods and ebbs, that hour before, and that our side is the weaker tide. So, um, what I've got here is a couple of excerpts from the Winning Tides Atlas. Um, I don't know how clear this is. Um, let me try and make that bigger for you. I'll probably annotate mm. that a bit for me too. Don't know how well this goes. Mm, sure. If we need it. Okay, so first thing to notice, this is showing the high water minus three hours referencing Portsmouth, remember? So three hours before high water. So if the tide is what, 22.07 today, what time is this? Be ten past seven, okay. wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I've lost my pointer. This is bad news. I knew this is going wrong. This has gone horribly wrong. Okay, I won't point. The other things to notice on there are it going in the green arrows showing it traveling to the east on the flood, and then the red arrows after high water showing as it ebbing going out to the west. And then I've highlighted a couple of arrows on there to show you where the um, stronger Shame. flow on the ebb is. So if you look, um, I've got them coming through Hearst there, where you've got 3.3 knots on the flood through Hearst Narrows, but on the ebb it's at 4.4. So as you approach Hearst on the ebb, it's definitely going stronger. And on the shoreline, you can see on the shoreline there, up by Berth and Boy, it's 3.3. And if you look at it on the other one, it is showing 2.8 on the ebb. So it's a massive difference. Now these arrows are showing it at spring tide, which is a slight disadvantage of this book. But what I want you to think of is in relatives. So the tide on the way in is softer than it is on the way out. What's the other thing you notice from this chart about the size and the size of the arrows rep represent magnitude of the tide? What do you notice about those arrows? Bigger in the middle, in the, in the, in the bigger in the middle, yeah. And why is that? It's deeper. <laughs> yeah, it's deeper water. Yeah, so in the tide atlas here, the white is showing um, deeper water, like the Admiralty charts do, and the blue is showing shallower. Okay. Give me a second, see if I can relocate my mouse. Okay. Oh, there, there it is. Found it. <laughs> hey, we're okay. We can continue. Sorry, that was blocking that, wasn't it? Okay. So I just wanted to show you what that tidal atlas looked like so you could visualize it. And one other point of interest, and it's only because we've been talking about flow and vortices and everything else, is at Black Rock on the, over on the island, just off the island entrance, off, sorry, off the Yarmouth entrance, you get a back eddy on the flood. Okay, because the tide comes around, you've got a little, effectively, it feels like a headland here and it swings around underneath it. You also get that in Keyhaven as well, as it, as it comes around past Hearst, it dives back in here and circulates. So if you have a race up at Keyhaven or cruise up there, you'll notice the tide can circulate quite strongly. And it, on the ebb, actually, it could flow really strongly across the spit here. Well, if we, um, if we was to consider the central point of the Isle of Wight, um, and to the right of the center of the Isle of Wight, is the opposite of this true, namely, when the tide is coming in, it comes in from um, the, the, the east. No, and it, comes no it, it tends to come through. It's, it's always across us. So what actually matters here is how it flows around the UK coast. Right. So it floods to the east around the south coast, along the south coast. So even the other end of the Solent is affected by that. So you'd still be on an east going tide on the flood at the other end. So right, if, you, if you sail out of Portsmouth or further, further over to Chichester Harbour and hailing, 
it's going to be east going on the flood and west going on the ebb. Great question there, thanks. Carl, have you got any pointers on the, if we were, if I was in a boat looking at a, a lobster pot or a- Hang on a minute, wait for it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> it's not all theory. Any other questions on this? No. Great. Okay. What we also need to know at Livingston, this is supplementary information. So the tide turns on the shore first. Okay. So we said it was like an hour before as a, a guide to when the tide's turning. What actually happens is it's a gradual change across the Solent. Okay. So it starts turning. So if it's say, let's say it's flooding on the shore. Sorry, if it's flooding in the whole Solent and the tide's about to turn, it'll start ebbing, going out on the shore first. Okay. And what you need to watch out for is signs on the inshore racing marks and on the black cans where the fishermen, the fishermen drop in the water for which way the tide's going. And you're looking for that turn. And on the shore, you're looking for that turn at about an hour and a quarter before high water Portsmouth. Okay. And on a neat tide that can take easily half an hour for the tide to change across the whole Solent going out into the deeper water in the middle. So where that's relevant is if you're either cruising across the Solent in your dinghy to go to Newtown or something, or you're racing on a Thursday night with the Royal in a keelboat crewing for someone. The tide whilst on the shore can be going one way for another half hour, it could be going completely opposite way in the middle. Okay. But going back to Jeff's point there, really important to look at anything in the water that's mud. So like the cans, like Bavistock, whatever it is to be able to see which way the tide's going on it. So as it goes past, the can will make a bow wave and you're looking for the stream behind it to indicate that's which way it's going. Okay. Quite often see it on the river as you come out, as we hit the tide, as it, on the posts themselves, you can see it going across. Okay. Um, I haven't noticed very much slack water at Livington. It doesn't stand, it doesn't stay still for very long on the, when off in the Solent. It's either going to America or going to Russia. There doesn't seem to be a lot of middle ground there. If, if it is slack, it's only for, for moments. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. What does your last sentence mean, Carl? Uh, it doesn't. If any slack water, I was about to write something else in there, but I didn't. <laughs> should, I, should I do that on the fly again? Hang on. Can I, Carl? Yeah, please go on. If there's a big wet patch on the forest after heavy rains <coughs> and the the Limington River has got a lot of runoff on it, it will affect the tidal stream just yeah, in... It does in the uh, river, doesn't it? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good point um, which Jeff's made there is what happens if we get um, a load of rain, it comes, into, it comes down onto the Limington River, but the Limington River is effectively barricaded at the toll bridge on the way out to Wolhampton. So what they do there is they open the sluice gates at uh, low water to let that run off so it doesn't flood behind it. And what you'll notice is brown water on the surface and it runs, I find, I think I see it run to about the first rockery just to the corner there. Um, but it definitely affects you if you're doing a, a Wednesday night start or something from a club line, um, that surface current can drag you over the line. If you think the tide's flooding, the actual surface current is going out of the river. But that, that's something that's local to the river. At the moment, we're just sort of focusing on the sort of solar area where we're, where we're saying, but it's a great point. Cool. Right, general advice. So if you're free sailing without assistance, um, like David was, and David brilliantly summed this up, um, he didn't want to go against the tide or the, the wind on his way home, consider sailing up tide first. OK, so when you come out of the river, turn right if the if the tide's flooding, if it's coming in, you want to turn up tide first. OK. And if it's ebbing, you want to turn left to the east, put your nose into the tide going that way. OK, any idea why you might do that? Get a bit of help from the, from the tide to move you along. 
it's as much about you are getting help but it's on the way back it's making sure you can get home okay so if it goes really light it's probably the biggest thing is just make sure you're not stuck down tired miles and tricky to get back and also if you do you know capsize or something you just get pushed down a bit before you manage to get yourself sorted out you're not you're not too far down tired okay um You've probably already discovered this, but a medium to strong southwesterly wind against a spring ebb tide makes it pretty sporty in the Solent. So this is a wind over tide situation. You've got the tide, you've got the wind blowing through Hurst and the tide trying to go out through Hurst. And at our section of the Solent, it becomes really um, steep, short waves. And this can build really quickly after the turn of the tide. You can see it, you can start reading on the water. We talked about reading the water before, didn't we? So even as the tide's turning, it's a really good sign of the tide turning. You're getting that short, sharp stuff. And especially when it gets breezy, that can lump up quite, quite well. Um, I think if you watched any videos of Pete Barton and Liam selling their arrows in loads of breeze, that is definitely going on in some of those. So please be mindful of that. If you've just gone out for a gentle sail, if it's all nice, as soon as that tide turns, um, if you've got any sort of southwesterly, you can find yourself in a bit of lump. And just a sort of general racing or just general trying to get yourself somewhere, the slower the boat you sail will have more impact on the tide, will, will have more impact on how much um, you take into account the tide. So a scow is all about the tide. It's, you know, you go up the mud to stay out of the tide because they, as soon as they go offshore, they just get washed backwards. And a foiling moth or musto skiff will be all about not hitting the bottom, staying out the weed and just staying a bit further offshore. I think we discussed that the other night, didn't we? Um, and as Jeff said for that, if you're racing to keep your wind clear from the slow boats that are chugging up the shore. Um, I know we've talked a lot about weather and wind so far, but unless the wind is blowing across the Solent and it's a slack tide, wind strategy or a turning tide, sorry, not slack tide, Turning tide, wind strategy isn't necessarily your highest priority. It's a factor, but tide is absolutely king here for most boats that we sail, sort of factoring in where we're going. Any questions on that? Okay. Try and steam on a bit because I'm conscious that I'm eating into Gareth's hour. So building a mental picture. So what I mean by this is um, trying to think what the bottom looks like, where the deep patches are. And it's obviously a satellite image of the Western Solar and it just shows um, sort of light and dark patches on the bottom. And this is more as a sort of um, silt and shingle and sands being moved along. But oh, I just wanted to show you very quickly the chart. And what, what do we notice about the chart? This, this is the opposite way around. So this is an in chart. So the color coding is different to the, the one I showed you earlier. White is shallow, blue is deep. What do we notice? And where do we think the tidal stream will be strongest? In the blue. Yeah, in the blue. It's the deepest water, isn't it? Can you see the numbers get deeper? Uh, get larger, 29s, 23s, 24s, compared to where we sail up here. Uh, this is very low spring, lowest astronomical tide. It's 0.6s, 0.8s, and even some of this yellow is underwater. It's sorry, it dries out where it's got a bar under the number there. It means it's actually above above the water line at very low low tide. Okay, so building a mental picture. If we look at the racing charts, because they simplify that um, Imray chart. And we, we think, and we also take a cross section so that we can build a picture where the tidal stream will be strongest and why. And what I want you to do for this, and this is how I learned it, was imagine that the racing marks we use that are out there are laid in three strings running parallel to the coast and moving outwards. You've got a string inshore, a string offshore, and a string right offshore. Okay. And if we use those as a marker, they tell us on the water roughly where the depth contours change. Okay, they're not exact, but it's a really good rough guide because we're sailing around with dinghies without echo sounders, without a navigator, without an iPad on whoever's doing the nav. We've got to do it very quickly and just factor things in just like that by, by gauging where we are. So this is our, um, this is the keelboat racing chart. So it shows some of the, you know, it's, it's slightly larger, it's, it's smaller scale, isn't it? It's, and our training racing area is that yellow area. 
That red and green is showing you the ebb and the flood. Worth remembering those numbers if you need to, because that helps you know if you've got your bow into the tide or across the tide. Okay, that's the. And if we zoom in on that yellow area, we come to our dinghy racing chart. And this is the three lines of buoys that I was talking about. Um, if you ignore the river mouth for the time being, because obviously that area there is dredged, but we don't tend to, when we're racing, we tend to, we tend to send you either left or right of the river. We don't tend to send you backwards and forwards across it. Um, so if we come up, up the side that we'd start on a Sunday morning or Saturday afternoon training, you've got these line of inshore buoys here and they are on the sort of shallowest depth contour. As you move out to Bavistock, Spade Plus, these are the edge of much deeper water. And then when you get out to the keelboat marks, you're gonna use a bit of imagination here. Um, but there's, there's um, F, D and then C and then B. All of these are kind of on the close to the five meter contour. So it shelves very deeply after that. So these boys are sat in a bit of tide, but just beyond that, it's even worse. Now it tends to be only the fast handicap boats that get sent around those ones, but occasionally you might be sent. And certainly if you race from the Royal on a Monday night and join in their dinghy racing, they quite often send you around these to keep you out of the way of the scows that are all inshore. Okay, so I find this line of boys a really simple way of remembering, especially where Bavistock is. If you line up Bavistock and Plus Boy or Bavistock and kind of Jack in the Basket, that's a really good way of thinking. Yeah, it's deep water beyond that. And if I'm trying to fight the tide, I might be better off being in it or even in a bit further, if that's the case. Any questions on that? A lot to take in there. Does that make sense? How you might visualize those boys? You've had the fast track here, Mr. Markham. It's taken me 20 years to get this. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, and that's just recapping on the, the deep water, shallow water thing and we're the strongest. Okay, this is your simplified cross section, if you like. So on the left here is the shore at England, at Limington, and it shelves away very gently, very shallow. We've got the inshore racing marks, the offshore ones, and then down to the keelboat marks at the five meter contour. Then it goes out for a bit and then it drops like a stone into the main channel. And then the Isle of Wight, the Isle of Wight's pretty shelfy to be honest. There's not a lot of drop off on the island. It comes, you can sail almost right into the shore at very high water um, in some places and you're in plenty of depth. <clears throat> it comes down like that. So that's quite a good way. That's that mental visualization sloping off the shore as you get to the um, Bavistock, it's deeper. And then Kilbert marks are much deeper. What does that mean for the tide? This flow? Two, two points. Where's the tide going to be strongest? Here, here, yeah. here, or here? Yeah, the deepest water, isn't it? Yeah. And what, okay. what was in the depth and tide? It changes direction an hour before in the shallower bit. Yeah, about an hour and a quarter right on the beach. And then out here, it's a bit later, depending on whether it's neap or spring. Okay, I think, um, I think that'll do. I run on far too long. Is anybody still awake? Any questions? Too much information? Oh, I'm still awake. I'm still awake. You're still awake, Jeff? Oh, cool. One thing, can I add? Of course you can. If you've got a paddleboard or a kayak or a floaty thing or you want to go for a swim at low tide, go and look at the river Low Springs because that will show you what Carl's just tried to demonstrate in the, in the confines of the river. Yeah, the mud. Mud, 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 mud. Yeah, I think this picture here shows it, doesn't it? This this is taken slightly beyond Oxy Lake, um, where I was walking the dog yesterday. But this is fairly typical. I mean, Oxy Lake looks like that when it dries, doesn't it? And the the river is fairly similar around the edges. And as you look up the shoreline, you've got this. Can you see how it gently shelves away? So the birds are still walking out here somewhere, and that shelves out. And I, I did have another picture which I haven't put in there of the change of colour in the water. You can almost see it here. Sort of as it goes out, I was trying to capture that, but I couldn't really do it that well. Um, but yes, you see this shelving, shelving shore. And quite often, a good guide is actually 
what the topology is on the shoreline as to how deep the water is going to become. So on the island, you've got all those hills, so it drops down quite quickly afterwards. I mean, if you go to the the, Aust the Italian lakes, you see that, you know, come straight down and the water is immediately very deep. And on this shore where it's marshland and very, very shallow gradient, that's what you're getting some way out into the Solent, if that helps you remember. Okay. Any questions? One basic one, which is, where can we get these racing chart marks from? Oh yeah, from the office at the club. Yeah, or, or the bar, They're behind the or bar. Behind the bar, yeah. Also on the, on the club website, you can actually print your own as well if you've got a laminator or you, you know, it's, a, uh, if you get it, I think it's in the dinghy racing section, I think you can find the- It uh, is under the dinghy racing section, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're essential. So there's two charts. So if you're doing any long distance races, you'd, you'd take the, because um, we do do some long distance races, you want that one. And in fact, you might want slightly beyond that because sometimes we send you into Christchurch Harbour. I try and avoid those ones in my area. It's quite hard work. <laughs> um, so if you're doing those or if you end up Kilbert racing, this is the one to look at um, for normal Wednesdays and Saturdays. Sorry, Wednesdays, Saturdays and Sundays, this will cover you. Okay. Excellent. I can't remember how much each they are. They're not much, are they? No, no. It's a couple of quid, I think. Two quid okay. for three. Say so again, three, Tony. Two, two pound for an A3 and one pound for an A4. Thank Ooh. you, Commodore. What happened to the hat? You take it off because coach came in. I was getting hot. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he might spot you. <laughs> okay. Right, I'm going to hand over the con back to Gareth. Yeah, I've got that reclaimed. Well done. Okay, well done. Thank you very much. All right. Mm -hmm. so is everyone still happy to do a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. Thumbs up, I, everyone. I am yeah. going to apologise for eating in there, Gareth. All right. Don't worry. It's, it's a subject that a lot of people really wanted us to uh, say. <clears throat> All right. Slow boat, flex, and, and exercises. So a bit of both here. Um, right. We're going back to lift and drag. There's a reason that I'm using these terminology because it applies to sails, it foils under the boat, it applies to the hull. And I think it's two concepts. Continuously think about sailing and performance of your sail, and your hull and your foils in lift versus drag. Then everything kind of all clings together. There's a lot of similarities. Okay, so questions to you all. What is the difference? different about lift and drag at slow speed? How do we use this to our advantage to control our boat? So uh, yeah, sh shout some random ideas through if you've got any, anyone? You re re reduce lift and increase drag. Very good, Paul, yeah, excellent. And uh, anyone wanna have, how can we use this to our advantage? Maybe that's just a bit too subjective a question to pose because there's quite a few things there. All right, well, look, as Paul said, less lift, more drag at slow speed. How do we use this to our advantage? Control, feel, momentum. These are the things we're looking at. These are the things we're trying to, you know, can, the, the three things that I think concern me when I'm at slow speed. I want to feel and control. I want to be able to feel the boat and what's happening to it whether I've got lift happening because there's flow over the foils uh, or if I've got drag or if I'm trying to cause the drag and momentum when I want to know, I need to know whether that boat's going fast or slow. Okay, so lift and drag, quick ways to stop, quick ways to get moving. So this is apparent to, you know, lots of different scenarios, whether we're racing and we're, we're looking at pre-starts or whether we're just trying to get on or off our very tricky slipway. You know, sometimes there's a million scows on a Monday night or, you know, a busy Wednesday or uh, Sunday morning. Um, you know, it, you don't want to hit any of your friends. You want to keep the boat under control. And I know that a lot of people get very worried about going out for a sail at Livington. It's, it's quite an area to uh, launch. But 
people get the hang of it very quickly. So hopefully a few tips here will help us move forward. Okay, so what are ways, it's a question to you all, what are ways to stop the boat, slow it down or slow it down fast? Anyone got any ideas? Head to wind. Yep, head to wind, yep. Turn the boat into the wind. Any others? There's quite a few of these, I think. Just let your boom out so that um, the, the flow stops over your sail. Yeah, yeah, let the sail out, yeah. Stop the flow on the sail, yeah. Bury the transom. Very good, Mr. Gaiman. Well done, yeah. <laughs> what other thing did we talk about last week? We were talking about foils. We were talking about using the rudder as a brake. Aggressive rudder movement. That's yep. another but here we go. There's just a few there for you. So let the sail flap, like you said. Uh, aggressive movements of the rudder. You know, if you want to slow the boat down, use the rudder as a brake. It doesn't mean sculling. You can you can get pinged if you're racing for that. But um, turning sharp uh, or, 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 or zigzagging the boat can uh, slow it down quite quickly. Simon Gaiman, point, sit as far as possible and dig the stern in the water. That will slow the boat down very fast because she's under very bad trim then. Um, pushing the boat out, so kind of going into where Claire was saying, but actually if you if you back the sail, you know, you could actually stop the boat and then sail it backwards, which is always a, a great bit of practice. And uh, and the first one, sorry, I can't remember who you called that, was Wayne, wasn't it? Uh, turn into the wind? No, it was someone else, sorry. I, I can't see all the faces when people are calling. <laughs> okay. So how do we speed the boat back up again quickly under control? Any any thoughts there, everyone? Pull main sheet in. Main sheet in, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Bear away. Bear away, yep. Yeah. Got a few more. Sit forward. Sit forward, in, yeah, yeah, sit, sit in the correct space. <laughs> Yeah, stop digging that stern in again. Um, the other one you see a lot of people doing, and they get accused of cheating sometimes, uh, is pumping. So we've got pull the sail in, stop moving the rudder. As we said, to stop the boat, we want to use it as a brake. To start the boat again, we want to really keep that rudder down to an absolute minimum. Pumping the boat, you know, giving it some heel, then gently pulling it up with the sail eased a little bit. That'll encourage movement over the sail and the foils, get you moving. And as the other one there, I think, was that Mike Slay, I think, bear off? Uh, yeah, another thing we could do is just bear off a bit and that'll increase speed, that'll help accelerate far. Okay. Now, we remember from last week, when we heel the boat to windward or to leeward, the bow moves. So if we heel the boat to leeward, the bow will turn up into the wind. How do we how do we control that? So sitting forward. If you sit forward, it makes the bow turn into the wind. If ever you've done windsurfing, you'll probably know that uh, as you pull the sail back, you turn into the wind. As you push the sail forward, you turn away from the wind. Same thing with the weight of your boat. Uh, you know, a lot of people say if you're capsized and you're struggling to get the boat facing into the wind for whatever reason, you grab on the bow for a while, the boat will turn into the wind, it'll make it easier to ride the boat afterwards. And again, sitting up makes the bow point away from the wind. So we can control when we've got the boat heeling to leeward or to windward, but we can, we can also control which way the bow's going by moving our own body weight forward or back. Everyone with us? Good. Okay, so the more we practice this, muscle memory will take over. So there are a list of exercises there. We're gonna, gonna have a quick chat through, and then I'm gonna show you a few quick vids of people doing some of these exercises. But these are great sailing technique exercises for anyone, no matter whether you're cruising, you know, or, or, or racing or at, at any level. <clears throat> These things, being able to control your boat when it's going very, very slowly, it's incredibly difficult. And being able to uh, hold the boat at a boil for a minute. 
you know, you just keep the bow sort of within half a boat length of that buoy and just practice holding your boat in one place, seeing what happens. Um, and go, pulling the trigger. It's a, it's a technique that's used in racing to go from a standing stop to accelerate to full speed. People talk about pulling the trigger, which is basically initiating a very large pump uh, to get, get acceleration. Um, another great practice is to try and stop the boat fast, the crash stop, you know, like you do when you do your, your driving test. So we could use maybe a bunch of the techniques that we talked about that would slow the boat down, you know, moving all the way aft, letting the sail go, holding our hand out, uh, so that if we come into an area like the slipway or into a start and we suddenly realise we've got no room, there's someone in the way, that we can actually stop the boat, keep the boat under control and manoeuvre out of uh, causing any harm. The handbrake turn. This is basically a, a trick I like where you go into attack or a jibe, but come out stationary. So if you go into attack, as you come out on the new tack, you don't pull the sail in. You use lots of rudder going into that tack. So when you come out, the boat stalls completely and you keep the boat under control. And then you know you can uh, you can you can work out where you need to go. Great one for arriving at the slipway after a good sail, or uh, if you like me, like coming into a start line on port and then tacking into a hull, that can be a great manoeuvre. Another great thing that I like to do uh, when I'm coaching with people is getting people to try to sail very slowly up or downwind. So sailing slow. A lot of people can do that, um, but keep keeping the boat moving because we've got tide at Livington. Go and find yourself a little fishing mark or, or one of the boys in a decent bit of tide and just try and keep the bow of the boat into the wind. But, you know, maybe a boat length from the buoy and keep it there and try and actually take the boat slowly through a couple of tacks whilst keeping the boat the same distance. So, you, so you're very gliding the tide. The boat's not moving uh, forwards towards the mark. It's stationary, but you're, you're going through actual tacking the boat from one side to the other. Downwind. So how do you sail very slowly downwind? Anyone got any ideas? Dead run. How do we sail down and jibe slowly? I'll give you, where's the sail when you sail dead downwind? Oh. All the way out. You ever yeah. tried? Try it in. Yeah, try pulling it all the way in, like your um, like your your close hauled, yeah. and, uh, and 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 sail dead down and jibe the boat a couple of times. Get a feel for sailing the boat head downwind, and and, and and the balance of the jibe. You know, um, see how slow. Um, follow the leader is a great game that we often play when we're warming people up before coaching sessions where. Someone sits in the rib and, and, and we go out and uh, and basically, you know, you follow the rib. You've got to stay one one boat length, two boat lengths behind. And, and we'll take you upwind, jibe, stop, accelerate, just to get your boat control, get your familiarization. But if you're just going out with a couple of friends, you get someone to be the leader. You follow them. You, you try to stay two boat lengths behind them. When they stop, you've got to, you know, great exercise to improve boat control. The figure of eight course in the river. This is one of my favourites that uh, I've done a bunch of times with people. As we go out past the rockery, you've got a line of red mooring boys in a sort of arc shape. What you do is you, you pick two or three of those boys, and the idea is to slalom around those boys, tack round and go back downward. So you're doing windward and lured. And because you're in an arc, you can generally find two boys that form the windward lured course. And you can, you can sail in between those marks, which means you've got to tack, jibe, keep the boat under control, and you, you try and keep yourself in as kind a space as possible. Sounds really easy when I say it, but uh, I know Simon Gaiman's case, and uh, it can be pretty painful, can't it, Simon? Excellent. Favourite exercise. And here he is, Simon Gaiman uh, in his RS100, looking at some slow boat. Now, Simon came and coaching a couple of years ago uh, he's a, a good friend of mine's brother and um, 
uh, he wanted to do the RS regatta at Lewington, it's RS Southern, there's RS 100, he's in here. And one of the th first things he said he wanted to work on was his uh, starting. So got him in the river, this is just off the pontoon, and we're doing some slow boat here. So I, I, I actually thought Simon's very natural at doing this, he's got a good control. Uh, and we'll look at a couple of things while we're going through this. So just click this on. So you can see not too much wind, nice and light. You can see a few gusts on the water. And Simon's just trying to not hit the pontoon. So he's got the hand on the boom, bit of backward sailing, steering the boat in reverse. There we go. He's still into reverse. Now he's trying to get the boat to turn away from the wind. Okay, so he's just shooting on to get a bit of rotation on the boat. There we go, that's nice. And, feeling over. and I've created like a little imaginary start line. So it's just going to pump the boat and get the boat moving. There we go. Anyone got some questions on that video? Do we sort of see what, what we're looking at there, what we've been chatting about? Sort of slow, slow manoeuvring, keeping the boat under control. Right, here's another one. It's a little game Simon and me developed. Um, it's a simulation. He's got one minute until the start. Now I'm standing on the edge of the club pontoon and the start line is from the corner of the pub, club pontoon, sort of just, just slightly out of focus where my cursor is there, uh, to the yellow ball. In fact, it's probably the club pontoon is probably about there somewhere. Um, it actually, the start line lines up as a transit with that green post in the distance there. So if you lined up the yellow mark, so Simon's got a minute now to get round and, it, and find a place on this pretend start line. And this is a windward start, you know, the wind blowing out the southwest there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a little uh, place to practice your start line tech in a nice controlled environment. Just a little bit of breeze on the water there, a few little gusts, quite light. Nice control. Okay, so it looks like he's about to go back. He's looking at his start line for where to go. And that is your handbrake turn kind of tack. Lots of rudder movement and came out of it with a sail flapping, trying to stop the boat completely. The boat was still moving a bit. He's, oh, and there we go. Moving to the back of the boat, lifting the bow out. Stops the boat. The boat starts turning away from the wind as he's doing that. And he's steering to counter that. And then getting ready for his start, a heel, a pump, and over. So a heel, a pump, and a bear away there. I think you got most of the techniques I, I mentioned earlier on. Good work. Uh, Simon and me did a, you know, gosh, probably we did that same exercise about 20 times a day, just getting a feel for moving the boat, getting her moving, making a stop, keeping her under control when she's going very slowly. You could either do this here in the river, or you can go out into the Solent, find yourself a little mark somewhere, you know, now, now that Carl's told you where the deep water and the shallow water is, you know, we're, we're going to be good navigators. So. Do you want to know where the marks are? Shall I tell you? <laughs> Outside Alistair's office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they will, they'll be back out soon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So slow boat handling. When is it useful? Where is it useful? So I think, you know, we've kind of chatted through a few of those things. So we use slow boat handling for, uh, for launching. Uh, if we're cruising, picking up mooring boys, mooring alongside a pontoon or another boat. These are all techniques that are very good for that. You know, if, if you're out with uh, uh, race coaches on the water and you want to go alongside the rib to have a chat, maybe debrief something you've been doing, uh, you know, again, slow boat handling of your boat at slow speeds. Uh, if you're yachting, anchoring, you look incredibly cool if you're uh, anchoring or uh, lifting anchor when um, man overboard on the chat there. Very good, excellent, sorry. <laughs> Didn't think of that one. Um, Pre-start for race, and then when we're coming back in, approaching the slip. Okay, just moving on to the next one. So back to the solo fleet at Lymington Town. Here's a little pre-start. And this shows a couple of boats with good slow boat technique and other boats that they've got too much power 
too much speed and you'll be able to see the difference in those boats. And um, maybe you can answer which boats you think did well and were under control and which boats weren't. Just looking at this photo as well, um, what can someone tell me about the tide at this point? Tide's going out. Yeah. What can you tell me about that tide going out, Jay? Is it really pumping out or is it not moving very fast? Glasses on. Hold on. <laughs> Not moving fast. No. And what's the reason you think that, Nick? Uh, the uh, the anchor line on the on Baverstock. Yeah. Is not tight. No. No. When the tide's moving fast, there's a wake off the back of Baverstock. It looks like it's well. It it's theoretically just two knots. Uh, through the water and uh, not over ground. And that line is bar tight. So yeah, if we see this line here looking slack and the boat's facing that way, that's up towards Portsmouth. So it looks like the tide's and it's just slow speed. Okay, so there's a fifth arrow about to come into the picture here. Uh, keep your eyes on the different boats. And uh, I think three of them have got this kind of darker north sail and two of them have got the lighter HD sales. Let's see what happens. Uh, this is about a minute to the start line. The start line is where the camera is to um, the uh, forward mast on Baverstock. So you see Mark's come up to the line, sailed over it slightly, but he's got his boat moving slowly and he's thinking, you know what, I'm early. I'm going to go around and do this again. Next boat there. He's probably thinking, I'm a bit early too. But he decides to go the other way and get back into that little gap. He's moving very quickly there. The other guys are all holding back, giving the guy at the front some room. And the start line, he's over the line. He sailed back, so he's not the walls. And three, two, one, go. Nice clean starts by those three boats with the grey sails. Uh, this guy, I think that's Jeff there. He's just a little bit second row. And uh, I think that was uh, Malcolm uh, ended up going off on port because he was, he was in the area at the beginning. Shall I just go back to that start there somewhere? Where are we? Come on. So, yeah, Malcolm here. Mark's too early. He's going to go back and line up. Malcolm's too early. But you see his bow's a long way away from the wind, so his sail keeps loading up. Now he's on a beam reach. Now you can see the boat's picking up speed fast. He goes through a very fast tack, not a handbrake turn. Not showing very well, Gareth. It's not showing at all. Oh, uh, sorry. It's showing really well on my PC and not on there. Yeah, it's frozen on him. Ah, oh, sorry, guys. Um, he's not here to defend himself anyway. He's yeah. not. Uh, wait a sec, I've lost the screen share now. Ah, my Zoom seems to be cutting out. You okay, you still there? Yeah, I'm, I'm still there. But yeah, the, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, no, I can hear you right. You can the, you? Yeah, the computer's on the other Zoom and that seems to have... Oh, the one with the... Yeah. Have we not got Jane Homewood's amazing start to see? I know, I know. I promised we were going to see that. See, the reason I've stayed up. It is, I know. It is one of the best. There's a good... We I'm so sorry. don't need to see that. We so... You do. This is amazing. This is you roasting your son and your husband. Yes. Here exactly. he is. This, the... <laughs> hey, right. Will. Okay. I think I've got this reconnected. Oh, come on. Sorry, I'm having a really bad couple of days with technology. Everything's there. Uh... I can't Don't worry. We can take any questions in the meantime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, while, but... while, while, while Gareth undoes the plug or does whatever he has to do. Can I just ask? Uh, I, I missed, I got an interruption. At the handbrake, was that a uh, tack and sharp tack and don't shoot in? Sharp tack and, and, and stop the boat. 
Okay, just let the sail go. Yeah, so let, let the sail out during the tack. So, yeah, come out the tack sitting a long way. Out. You know, always good technique to. Um, yeah, come out of the boat sitting a long way. Um, right, I think I should be able to jump on there. Is that all right? Connecting. I'm prepared to wait for Jane's start. I know <laughs> it is a beauty. Yeah. Mm. But I'm afraid I might be being let down by technology a little bit here. Uh, ooh, sorry. Okay, here's the deal. If we can't get it up tonight, we will put it on the club Facebook tomorrow. Yeah. Newsletter. Headline. Newsletter. <laughs> There's nothing to be ashamed of, Jane, I promise you. It's magical. No, it is absolutely. Okay, let's see if I can get While Gareth's sorting himself out, any other questions? Anything you want to ask about anything you've seen tonight or previous episodes or, or Gareth's just run through there? The other thing that strikes me, Carl, would be fantastic if we could follow this with some sessions. You know, just the, uh, that thing that uh, we could see Sam and do that, those, uh, those manoeuvres next to the, uh, uh, in, the sort of the, in the river there. Oh, yes, going afloat and doing it properly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that goes without saying, really, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, we did we did that with the with the um, George's ladies' training group last year. We did we did quite a lot of that slow speed work, didn't we? Mm -hmm. we yeah, on. yeah, we did a lot of the um, you know uh, pull the trigger, and um, I'm yeah, afraid. So oh, no. let's see if I'm just going to go out and back in. See if that'll work. Oh, that's always a goer. It's always a goer. Or oh, can I share this off my iPad? Let's give that a quick run. Right, yeah, let's see. yeah I might do, you know. Give it a quick go. We've got them on the edge of the give seats. I reckon you've got about another minute before you lose them. No pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, any other questions? Just keep them coming. Any observations? What's that, Michael? I was just wondering if I was just wondering if there's a computer training group. Yes, there is. <laughs> That's on a Tuesday at 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, we can see it. If he had more time, he could go for the tried and test. He'd turn it off and turn it on again, Root. Yeah. Oh, genius. No, and it's still not turning back on again. Um, we can see your screen. We can see slow boat control presentation of LTSC. Does that help? Yeah, that's good. Is this is, a, is this there a is Welsh, a wheel of death? Is it a Welsh broadband connection? This. Uh... Okay. Oh, you went there. You went there. I, I think I, I, I didn't think we we're doing the Welsh thing for a while. While we've still got our tail between our legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to beat the French this weekend as well. Yeah. I don't fancy my chances of getting this one up, I'm afraid. We might have to save oh. okay. the hmm. Okay, not to worry, Gareth. I mean, to be honest, we, we're probably we're running towards late. the end anyway, aren't we? That's my fault. Yeah, I'm afraid I just can't get this thing back on. So is, there, is there anything we're missing, Jane? Is that, is that what's the... Uh... It, it was the big finale. It was the big finale, watching yeah. Jane Wilde do an absolute hammer with perfect slow boat control after practice in the water for an afternoon. And squeeze off her son to windward, like the, Italian, like the Italians tried to do to New Zealand this morning. Yeah. 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 Well, to some degree they succeeded. Yeah. Did, anyone, did anyone get up and watch that? Yep. Watch the reruns. Oh. So, so the rerun. It's on BBC Two, isn't it? Oh, is it? Yeah, it's on BBC Two for you this morning. I didn't realise, but I just woke up and I put it on. It was on BBC. Oh, no, I watched it at 7 a.m. I couldn't do it at 3 o'clock. No. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm angry enough during the day at work anyway. I thought that would really do it. <laughs> so, Gareth, I think we should save that for the opening the, the of the next session. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll post it. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll make sure the Vice Commodore's on for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lovely bit of family fun. <laughs> 
Uh, in fact, it'd be good if we could, if Will could talk us through that as well. That'd be really good if he could. Uh... Oh, he can't remember. There's been so many. <laughs> we, <laughs> so, so basically, what what the video was was a game. There's there was Jane, Will, and Steve all out in air raids uh, having a family coaching session, and um, and we set up a little start line and we just played a game where one person approached from port, two people approached from starboard. And you were just coming in with a minute to go to the gun and, and, and just trying to, to get yourself a good start, maybe make sure the other people don't get such a good start. It's a great little game, really easy for anyone to play. I've seen um, Pete Barton and uh, Dave Ellis out there, and they just do a continuous rolling one minute start and they literally shoot across the line, turn back, reset, get themselves in a position, hold the boat in its position, and uh, and see what they can do from there. And it's it's a great exercise for your your slow boat control. Anyhow, and in the video, the the Homewood boys got mullered. Is that the is that the uh, is, okay? Right. In showed some serious skills. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good. It's good. I'm down, I'm down for next week then. Complete fluke. <laughs> <laughs> it was you know, not. You put in the practice, Jane. Yeah, I was going to say everything you know. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much, Gareth. That was fantastic. Really cool. Excellent. Sorry, it was a bit fast. We'll uh, we'll post all this up on the uh, website on the uh, YouTube. And uh, again, if there's any questions after this that you think of later on in the week, you know, be keen to uh, fire them through to us, and we'll we'll see if we can get some answers to you. Super. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Carl. Much Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Special thank you to David thank as well for this right. presentation you put together earlier. That was magic. Thanks yeah, for that. A lot of effort there. Thank you. Well done. Thanks, David's Thanks, got the Student of the Week award, I think, for this. Oh, and some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Bye, Gareth. Thanks, Gareth. Cheers, all. Good to see you. Bye. Bye.